Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Saurabhi Ghimire, Research and Communication Associate at IMPI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandan Hindustan, Nay Dilli, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPI Web Policy Learning. We are gathered today for day one of a three day online certificate training program on understanding recurring heat waves, risk, impact, and the way forward for resilience. This training course is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, NITM, Ministry of Home Affairs, and IMPRI's Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, or CECCST, Impact and Policy Research Institute. The patron for the program is Shri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NITM, New Delhi. Our convener and moderator is Shri Dikender Singh Panwar, former Deputy Mayor Shimla and Senior Fellow IMPRI. Our conveners are Professor Anil K. Gupta, Head of ECDRM and ITM New Delhi, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director IMPRI, Dr. Somedip Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Vishwabharati Shanti Niketan, Visiting Senior Fellow, IMPRI, New Delhi. This course will be conducted by various expert resource persons comprising eminent academicians, journalists, senior researchers, and policy practitioners. The distinguished resource persons have great experience gained in the field along with their expertise. Our experts for our course are Sri Himanshu Shekhar Mishra, Dr. Neresh Kumar, Dr. Gulrez Shah Azad, Professor Joyshri Roy, Dr. Manu Gupta, Dr. May Matthew, Sri Anup Kumar Srivastava, and Dr. Pooja Paswan. Organizing team consists of Fatima Amin and Dr. Kopal Verma, NITM, Dr. Saurabhi Kimire, Utkarsh Divedi, and Dia Goswami from IMPRI. Now, let me give a brief outline of the specially curated course on this very topical issue. There is a strong and global scientific consensus that extreme heat waves will become more common worldwide because of the climate change, which will lead to rise in average global temperatures. Heat waves affect human lives by not only leading to dangerous consequences, such as heat stress and heat stroke, but it is also a cause of death and morbidity across the world. Such devastating consequences are likely to increase due to the changing frequency, severity, and intensity of heat waves caused by climate change. India too is feeling the impact of climate change in the recent years, with instances of heat waves becoming more intense in nature and has resulted in increase in the number of heat wave casualties. According to the World Bank, India's annual temperature increased at a rate of 0.62 degrees centigrade in the 100 years between 1901 and 2020. Heat strokes killed close to 12,000 people in the last decade between 2011 and 2020 in India, according to the data published by the National Crime Records Bureau. This three-day online training program aims to bring together professionals from academia, media, civil society, and the commercial and entrepreneurial sectors to start a critical discourse for our time. The overall goal of this program is to provide a solid interdisciplinary introduction to the heat waves in India, the prominent impact of climate change and heat waves, and several annual prepared tree and operational measures to control the crisis of increasing temperatures in India. The training program 
aims to create a platform to discuss information from various agencies and exchange experiences between professionals from varied backgrounds and other experts to reduce India's heat wave impacts. This will also assist the area in developing comprehensive heat action plans at, the, at different levels. We are very grateful to the NIDM team and particularly Professor Anil K. Gupta and his team and Tikender Panwarji for spearheading this timely training course on the important issue of heat waves and its impact. I welcome all of you for this enlightening deliberation and thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts in understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in disaster management and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course, which we believe will lead to a very fruitful outcome. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Share your question on the Q&A box. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee and ensure that your questions are precise. And please refrain from making any general comments in the questions to save time. Now, without any further ado, let us start our program. It is my honor to invite Professor Dr. Anil K. Gupta to start the program by his opening remarks. Sir, welcome and over to you. Fatima, can you check? Good, sir. Just one or two minutes, there were some issues in the some connection over there. Right. Sorry, we ate but first say housekeeping announcement, please. Oh. Okay. So uh, let me go through the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be Q&A session after each presentation. And please share a question on the Q&A box only. The questions should not be posted as an anonymous attendee. And please ensure that the questions are short and precise. And also, please refrain from making any other general comments in the question section to save time. Has sir joined? Yes. Okay. Please unmute yourself, sir. Professor Anil K. Gupta. Hello. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir, and welcome to the program. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, you are audible. Hello. 
yes 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 uh -huh. so welcome I'm, sir i'm here thank you thank you hello dr arjun yes sir good morning So you are still muted. Hello, Dr. Simi. Hello, sir. Good morning. morning. Good morning. I'm well, sir. How are you? I think there is a lag. Hello, sir. There is a little internet. Uh, internet is internet. Yeah, we are having some issues. So, uh, I think also try to get it. Okay, so uh, in the meanwhile, uh, can we move forward with uh, Shri uh, Tikender ji? Uh, uh, to share some words and open the session, sir. Hello. No, I think, sir, I, I think it's better if Professor Anil starts because he has, I think, been able to get through okay. the connection. I think yeah, we can wait for him for a few minutes. Hello. Yeah. Now it's working. Yes, please go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir, please yes, go sir. ahead. I have to speak. Okay, I yes. cannot. It's an yeah. There was some some network issue. Huh? It was it was tracking some other uh, the Wi-Fi. So uh, past few minutes I was struggling with uh, some internet issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, first of all, I would uh, uh, on behalf of uh, National Institute of Disaster Management and uh, IMPRI uh, joint team, I would like to welcome. Uh, Sri Tekandar ji, our good friend, and uh, other resource persons, and all the participants of this very, very important uh, uh, discussion. And I would also like to compliment uh, Dr. Arjun and team, Dr. Simi and uh, Dr. Gimre, uh, Ms. Fatima, and all in the team for uh, organizing this. Uh, three days very important uh, discussion though uh, in many parts of the country now we have uh, 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 flooding uh, following the the rainfall and now the brunt of heat is uh, quite less as compared to uh, i would say that 40 50 days uh, before that we had but this year's uh, heat has uh, uh, reiterated uh, that uh, uh, despite of having an elongated uh, winter season this year uh, and uh, despite of some kind of uh, relief uh, in some or other form of the climatic phenomenon, heat wave remains uh, a very important and critical matter to be dealt by uh, our uh, local administrations and people in general. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the first major recognition of heat wave as a disaster, it was 2015. And uh, when uh, around uh, more than 3000 people uh, are known to be lost their life because of heat waves. But it has uh, started raising a number of questions that whether it was only 
the implications of uh, climate change on heat wave uh, occurrences are there are other issues associated maybe anthropogenic dynamic dimensions the kind of development that we have and the kind of uh, preparations or preparedness that is uh, that is needed uh, to to reduce the risk of uh, the irreparable lo losses these uh, heat waves may cause so those may be associated with the the design of our uh, urban systems design of our own uh, dwellings or buildings uh, clothing our food habits our uh, the occupations and also like working hours uh, so the the issues associated with risk issues associated with exposure issues associated with our resilience so how uh, various departments of the government should also look at uh, heat wave i think that has also emerged in past uh, five six years very very significantly uh, now authorities uh, they claim and we uh, agree to some extent that the losses of life because of heat wave has been we have been able to reduce significantly by the concerted effort and the credit does not go to a single agency or single authority but the credit goes to a greater awareness at all levels and how the local authorities have uh, taken steps how uh, they, they, we try to make people aware but there are a lot to learn that how heat wave has been affecting and which are the people who are affected more by these kind of heat waves then there are dimensions of health issues so what are the preconditions that make a person uh, uh, get affected more severely by 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 the heat wave so there are pre health conditions for example in covid also we used to talk about comorbidity so whether whether there are malnutrition or these kind of things are dehydration the, the already inherent dehydration are the pre pre uh, dehydration condition of the people that can that can contribute to major uh, impact of uh, the the heat exposure to people then uh, the various other uh, social dimensions occupational dimensions are there in heat wave so this uh, three days program i think it is uh, it is going to cover a lot of things but uh, I would again reiterate that we need to uh, look into details and very, very seriously that what kind of remodeling our development would need uh, looking to future. Because uh, if uh, the heat wave is not there for our uh, lesser heat wave is there for one or two years does not mean that the risk of heat wave has uh, gone down. So maybe next year or maybe and uh, not this city so other city may be may be uh, uh, facing these kind of challenge so i would be interested to uh, to listen to the ex experts uh, who are going to share their experiences and an idm has been documenting uh, the heat wave incidences with the purpose of identifying that uh, uh, what has been the perception of various sectors various stakeholders and how the state administrations and local administrations have taken this uh, uh, preparedness uh, for uh, for dealing with the heat wave and more particularly urisa and telangana we had uh, done a detailed study uh, uh, and uh, currently uh, my team is working on developing a training toolkit uh, for heat wave uh, uh, developing heat wave uh, resilience so i think this uh, training program uh, would also be a great insight for uh, for for those who are associated in uh, developing those kind of training toolkits or other knowledge uh, uh, knowledge base uh, for heat wave management so thank you very much uh, for uh, taking this initiative and uh, last point that uh, after this program uh, is over i i would be very keen to look at a very crisp uh, uh, and kind of a solid recommendations that uh, past seven years, I would say, counting from 2015, uh, the, the, the heat wave risk management approach in the country, whether the approach that we have that is adequate, or we need to, we need to, uh, we need to identify some of the, the, the points 
where we still have to uh, work more and whether we need to uh, to improve upon this strategy i think that would be very very important because uh, that will that we would like to take the advantage to integrate into whatever training toolkit we are developing and also to communicate to the higher authorities uh, to integrate into the policy policy process and uh, tikender ji uh, just to share with you and i will be discussing with you separately that we are, uh, after few months we are planning for a major uh, discussion for city managers so 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 the lessons uh, would be very very useful uh, uh, to communicate to them because uh, the, these two things cities are facing uh, major aspect one is urban flooding uh, that most of the cities are now facing challenge water logging and this and heat wave uh, recently we had a meeting with the, the jaipur uh, city mayor and she also referred to this that uh, now in fact the city managers are also open to learn and that is a good opportunity that i see so thank you very much and over to you uh, and looking forward to the discussions thank you thank you sir so much now i would like to welcome shri tikender singh panwar our course moderator and convener to take over the first session sir the floor is yours thank you sir bhai and uh, thank you professor Anil Gupta, it's always lovely to hear you before I start speaking because if, at least the context is set and I just have to do some of the formalities. So yeah, I think uh, before we jump to our experts and uh, ask them to uh, make their presentations, uh, I think this is what Arjun and Professor Gupta and I, we were discussing when we were conceiving and commissioning, finally commissioning this idea of uh, holding a, a a webinar and this uh, series on on heat waves because we we were also also thinking that you know by the time we will be holding this webinar and this training program probably the monsoon would be hitting and probably the the more desired uh, discussion would be on urban flooding and apparently that's what we are going to do very soon after this uh, where we talk about uh, you know. Uh, rainwater harvesting and whatnot. So, but nevertheless, I, I think uh, uh, this still holds very pertinent for the simple reason that uh, uh, actually, if you ask me, I mean, of course, the experts are the best people to, uh, to discuss on that. Uh, but I think there is a very strong connection between the way we are uh, 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 building our developmental uh, strategies, projects, processes, particularly in urban India, and uh, you know uh, these two important uh, uh, disasters. I would call uh, first urban flooding and second one heat wave. So there's a very strong connection. Of course, now we do not have to contest the basic idea that climate change is there, and the impact is quite wide, and the rising temperatures uh, are part and parcel. Uh, of, of uh, the climate change and its impact on us. But the key is, and I mean, this is what I have been always saying, the key is adaptability. How do we build our, uh, you know, developmental strategies so that uh, uh, we are more adaptive? We are, uh, you know, we lose less in terms of assets and in terms of lives. And unfortunately, that is what uh, the major challenge happens to be. Uh, let me just uh, cite uh, uh, just one anecdote, uh, you know, because I have been staying in Delhi for uh, for the last three, four years. Just report and then come back. I can tell you this on the bicycle. I don't know how many of you are using bicycles these days in Delhi particularly. But I can tell you the moment you cross, uh, I mean, you can see the difference. I mean, you can easily feel the difference on your body when you pass through Sriport, uh, through Ames, in the INA, and the moment you enter the Latins, I mean, you can just experience the difference. So the point is, why is it that you can, you can actually experience the difference of three to four degrees uh, Celsius? I think that is what, what uh, and the way we have been building our Kidway and others, and, uh, uh, you know, the whole, whole uh, rush and push for uh, what we call the transit-oriented development, where a huge, huge infrastructure and, and massive land use change is taking place in our city. 
So I think when our experts discuss about the cause of heat waves, and uh, we all know, I mean, most, most, most of us, we know what the cause of the heat wave is. But particularly what Professor Gupta was mentioning, I think, is how do we mainstream it? The challenge before us and you know, before all the urban practitioners is that heat wave is still not being part of the, uh, the mainstream planning uh, process. We have been able to bring in you know, that the, the elements of disaster risk reduction. But if you, if you ask me, I mean, when we, when we prepare these plans, I mean, Professor Gupta, uh, the Simla So this is becoming quite universal and just a question of which was also experiencing heat island effects, not heat waves per se. So this is happening universally across the Indian uh, subcontinent. Uh, we, I mean, we have the IPCC report, then we have the Working Group 3 report that focuses on mitigation. But I think the data screamingly comes back at us and says adaptability is the key. So what, what does that mean? I mean, what, what do we mean by adaptability? I think adaptability comprises all these issues. How are we building our structures? Why is it that in Delhi, you do not find a single competition taking place whereby you, you talk about conserving energy, where you talk about you know, uh, uh, climate resilient structures, where you use minimum air conditioning. And it's not that the air conditioning was introduced quite late. I mean, people have been surviving even before that. But I think this reimagining our, our towns, reimagining the building typologies particularly, and the disasters that we have done with the glass typology has been completely exposed during the COVID. And this also leads us to you know, the kind of uh, heat island effect that we get. And of course, further accentuating the heat waves. So, and the figures have already been discussed. I mean, we've lost lives. It's not that uh, people have not died. And lastly, what is important is it's a class X. I mean, this is something which we normally forget. Why is it, it's, it's a class issue? Because we probably uh, just generalize or universalize many things, not realizing that 93%, 94% of the workforce in the urban centers is in the informal sector. And there is a, a recent study, in fact, I quoted that in one of my articles recently, that 66% are exposed to working outdoors. So actually, it's it's not just the middle class and the upper middle classes. I mean, who have you know all the comfort um, and all the accessibility to modern gadgets, to modern capital. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> modern capital-led uh, developmental strategies where you just put on the AC and you know all that sort. But a large section of the people in our urban centers do not have access to that. How when we decide, you know, when we design, when we plan. I mean, if we have to mainstream it, I think that is the largest section that we have to. So why not, you know, I mean, something that was done by Sher Shah Suri long back, that after, you, you know, you have those milestones and you have those sarais, you have those trees, you have all that stuff. I mean, you know, all that was thought of. Why is it that now we are not thinking all that, which is very important when we are designing our towns, building our cities, and it's, and, and you know, this whole approach of, of project-oriented development, I think we have to get rid of that. And we have to do more comprehensive, more holistic, and mainstreaming, and you know what we said, interdisciplinary uh, approach so that we are able to, you know, I mean, secure our future, secure our future for our people. I think over to you, uh, Sorvi, I mean, we can, you can go ahead and uh, ask our first, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, just go ahead with the first presentation. I think that's enough from me. Uh, thank you, sir, so much. Uh, so it's, uh, my name is pronounced as Sauravi. And- Sorry, uh, Sauravi. Yes. Uh, yeah, what, I, what did I say? Suravi. It didn't okay. sound like Sauravi. Okay, Sauravi. Okay, Sauravi. Yes. Okay, yes. yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yes. Can this, sir, we have first session in, in 20, 25 minutes, but this session is yours. 
So I'm done. I'm, I don't think I have to say anything else there. But if you want to add few things, please add. No, I don't. No, because I, I, I was not aware of that. Otherwise, I would have brought in a presentation here, uh, Arjun. But I think that's enough because, you know, we need to hear more from our people. You know, but as you said, uh, so I think I have, I have uh, just tried to uh, build the broad contours on which we should uh, frame our discussion. Uh, but the point is, I mean, as Professor Gupta also rightly pointed out, is what do we get out of it? Uh, and which we take back to the people and we take back to the government, ask them, look, this is, this is the basic fault, you know, that is happening. And uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think I, I can see uh, from Dr. Simi to everyone, heat waves use of air conditions for the world. Yeah, true. So, and uh, so uh, uh, I think that can be a, uh, a kind of uh, uh, a document which, uh, with which we will be able to push the government that look, I mean, these heat waves are going to happen more rapidly now. It's not that it happened once and, you know, that's how, but, uh, and that's what the IPCC is also uh, pointing out, especially the fourth, I mean, the sixth IPCC six, that, you know, the incidence of disasters is bound to increase. And it's quite funny, you know, you have flooding and you have heat waves. I mean, what is this that, that is happening? And incidentally, Arjun, if you ask me, the, the core element of both is our developmental strategies. You know, the way we develop, the way we are building our cities. And and this is what I've, I've always been claiming. You know, if we, if we just dig into some of the smart cities, you will come to know that major flooding that is taking place is where the smart cities projects are, are being underlaid. Because you dig the town, and that's what I what, what I mean. I didn't want to develop that further, but you know that whole approach of project-oriented development. If you take a project, with, say for example, a flyover, not assessing that you know there are uh, water channels. Uh, there, I mean, there has to be uh, a complete hydro, uh, hydrology of of the town. You know, understanding the ecological footprint, and then you just uh, construct and go ahead. And Gurgaon is a classical example. I mean, I mean. I mean even if they are clouds, people fear that they're going to get flooded. I mean, forget about the rain. So what is it that we are building? And, and uh, Arjun, I'm doing something very interesting. I'm writing a piece on you know, 75 years of the transition of uh, uh, cities from, I'm not course, 75, 75 years of India's independence, how our cities have uh, uh, transitioned. But I just went a little back, not a little back, very, I mean, further back, right from the Harappan era to, to the... Can you believe, I mean, there was planning in Harappan era. You had, I mean, your streets right at right angles. You had all that stuff happening, you know, where, where your sewage cleaning was taking place. I mean, if they could do it some uh, 3,500 years back, I mean, what is it that that is lacking us? I think there is some problem with us. So, and that is, uh, I think, when, when I mean, what I have always been, uh, been claiming and what I've always been saying is, I think we have to go back to the basics of planning. The basics of planning means trying to have a comprehensive plan of the town, which is interdisciplinary, which incorporates all these elements, right, from, you know, not just one. I mean, we just work with the typologies or we just work with the land use phenomenon and just go ahead, not to mention that governance is such an important element. I mean, we've had towns and cities in our ancient history where we didn't have, you know, that superstructure governance model from the top. People govern themselves. So if they could do that, I mean, why can't we just allow this governance model to be further democratically decentralized? I think that can be one of the elements of uh, mitigating our uh, our disasters in the towns instead of waiting for the supreme commander to come and then you know then taking the lead. So I think all those aspects are very interesting. If we just go back, dig into our historical conjunct and build those conjunctures, I think uh, I think that, that's enough. Arjun, don't force me to speak more than that. So let's <laughs> We will take few questions from here. Yes, we can. To indulge uh, yes. much more into it. Uh, shall we go to right. what uh, Prakash ji is asking and then Dr. Sangeeta? Then I'll bring uh, the participants who are raising the hands. So, we would, will you go ahead with the QA? Sure, questions? sure. Yeah. So, uh, there are a few, a uh, couple of questions in the QA box. So, I'll just read it out for you. Uh, Prakash ji is asking, uh, have you made any specific provision for building resilience against heat waves in a smart city planning? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> because I wrote the Shimla smart city plan. I'm telling you, this is not even a consideration. And I mean, since I can say, I mean, I, have, I was one of the most, you know, concerned elements in, 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 in that team. 
So if it doesn't come to my mind, I mean, uh, we can imagine, I mean, how things have been done uh, with those large uh, tech consultants and, you know, where the focus has been more capital intensive technologies, you know, to attract capital. And that's how that's how we are going to mitigate our, uh, our disasters. So I can for sure say, I mean, uh, nowhere. I mean, I mean, if you have some examples, uh, at least prepare those disaster plans in the towns, at least prepare those disaster plans whereby you bring in these elements of uh, urban flooding and you know the heat heat wave that we're talking about so another question is by uh, dr sangeeta ji the question is as he quoted aurangzeb how can this example of planting trees and other works are helpful in present scenario to reduce heat waves come again i didn't co quote aurangzeb i quoted sher shah suri okay she got it wrong sher shah then. suri because you know he is the one who uh, who uh, built those grand trunk roads, no? GT roads. Just correct me if I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Not Aurangzeb. So how is it? Now take for example, I I give a very simple example. I'm a cyclist, and I have come from Shimla. I mean, you can see Shimla, which is a town that where the temperature doesn't exceed 29, 30 degrees. If it goes beyond 30, it rains. But I've come to Delhi where we touch 44, 45. Ask me what a tree means, you know. Ask me if you have a cycle lane. And let's talk about the pedestrians, okay? So, I mean, the, the kind of relief that it gives and, you know, the, the kind of impact that a heat wave will have on the people. And if you have planned, uh, you know, uh, structures, uh, for example, if you have planned... Uh, uh, like, like you have a bicycle lane, I and mean, in, in, and in that bicycle lane you have planning for uh, ensuring you know that uh, you have you'll have portable water on the way. It it will be such a big relief for a working population in in big towns where we do not even discuss these things. We think that these things to be very trivial, you know, I'm bound to happen. These do not happen all by themselves. And let me tell you that uh, in Delhi, uh, because as I told you, I've been cycling. The bicycle ones, by, by I say the, the black bicycle ones, they're almost 30 lakh. And this is the IIT daily study that we have. And large chunk comprises the informal sector and the commute almost 10 to 12, 13 kilometers every day, one side. So that means 25 kilometers uh, for, uh, for the work. What is it that we have done for them? You know, and they are the ones who are the severest hit with a heat wave because they have to go. They are our security guards, they are our gardeners, they are our domestic help and whatnot. So what is it that we've done for them? You know, we have to ask, ask this uh, from ourselves who are actually leading this juggernaut of uh, city development and city planning. So another question by uh, Satya Narayana ji. Uh, the question is why heat waves are increasing after 1970s over Andhra Pradesh and Orissa region? I don't know, because particularly because if it's Odisha and Andhra, let some of the experts uh, answer that question, because uh, I have not studied that why, particularly in that reason, uh, region. But I can tell you why it, it is uh, also, uh, I mean, what the scientists have been saying is that one, it's of course uh, the, the impact of climate change, but at the same time, it's also the way we have been urbanizing and the, the rapid urbanizing that uh, that is happening. But why particularly in that region, I think uh, some baseline data has to be started. I think it won't be, enough. I mean, you know, prudent from on my side to just comment and answer. Sabiha yeah. ji is asking, uh, what is the quickest way to reduce this heat wave in circumstances and how, how people should behave towards the environment? I, uh, oh, okay. Quickest way, I think, let again the experts, I mean, some of the health experts uh, explain because, you know, quickest way is to have water, it is sit under the shade, etc., etc. So probably that, and our experts can comment on that. And the second is interesting. How how do we, I mean, what was that, Doctor? Sorry? So how should uh, people behave towards the environment in order to reduce the impact people of heat waves? should behave to the environment that, look, this is this is mother nature and you know we we can't i mean the way things have happened in the last and that's what i call industrial capitalism you know where nature has also been commoditized that is what we have to just go away I mean, that's the crux we can commoditize you know we you, you 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 can commoditize many things like you know something where where you can 
uh, you can turn, I mean, in political economy, what we say, uh, turn from uh, use value to exchange value. Right? Exchange value means some I mean, commoditizing things, like you can commoditize your steel or whatever, I mean, all that stuff. Even utilities these days is getting commoditized. For heaven's sake, let's not commoditize nature. And actually, that is it, what is happening. You know, when you start commoditizing nature and trying to uh, appropriate more and more profits for the large, uh, I don't think it's prudent uh, on, let me just cite one example, Dr. Okay. I mean, that, that will just uh, uh, answer this question. Uh, you know, in the last four decades, uh, and there is this data that has come up that uh, the, uh, the, the increase in carbon footprint has been equivalent to what, you know, over the ages has been. Like, for example, if we have uh, contributed, say, say roughly 100 uh, billion tons of CO2, it's just, just a hypothesis. So in the last 40 years, we have contributed another 100 uh, billion tons of CO2. And uh, do you know, just Dr. Zwick, do you know that this contribution has come from just 30 large transnational companies. Just 30% has, sorry, the 30% has come from just 30 large transnational corporations. And they still continue to get subsidy on fossil, they still continue to get subsidy on cement. So do we, do we not know? Are we not, are we, not, we are not blind, we are not deaf, you know? We are listening, we are hearing everything. The point is, what we should do, uh, I mean, for a sustainable environment is, of course, build, uh, uh, build, uh, you know, this this campaign, this environment. But also, it is high time that we speak in political terms. We speak in, you know, in terms whereby uh, which which may not sound uh, sound too well for for certain sections. But they are the ones who have been responsible for plundering the environment, isn't it? So, and and this is what exactly is happening in England. Where they've said, you know, the the Labour Party they've pointed out that look, if you do not comply with the, with the green, uh, you know, the rules, then we'll not allow you to uh, even trade in the stock exchange. So why are we not witnessing such uh, kind of debate in India? I think that's also what we have done. That was just the large question. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Hello? This is Javed from Jumma and Kashmir. Okay. Uh, I just, I'm very ha happy about the presentation, which is mind-blowing and gave a lot of uh, visionary aspects. I just want to know about the inclusion of person with disabilities. Inclusive policies about the disaster management for person with disabilities. As we see, uh, due to heat waves, a number of uh, yeah. problems arise among the children who have mental illness, mental disabilities. They get their brain gets aggravated, and uh, sometimes they have harsh behavior, but they don't have the good environment they don't have the reasonable accommodation thus they uh, their problems are out of control for parents to also and sometimes harmful for others and uh, they are uh, so much drug dependent that they don't have sometimes choices to get the uh, uh, good drugs for them because of the immense poverty i just want to know uh, what smart city projects have uh, built in for the person with disabilities, children with disabilities, recreation, and other things in which the children engagement will be ensured during these type of climate conditions. Thank you, Javid. No, I don't have an answer. No, no answer at all, because unfortunately, I can't cite even one, one example in a smart city where, you know, something has been done for the disabled. And in fact, uh, I know some of the national organizations like the NPDR, National Platform for Disabled Rights, and I know the leader, Mr. Murli Dharan, who has been pointing out, I mean, this time and again, just as uh, Mr. Javed pointed out, actually, it is high time that we have to think out of the box. I mean, you know, we have to, I mean, this is all about inclusive planning. And it was why I say we have to go back to the people for this inclusive planning, because here are the people listening to you now. Look what uh, Mr. Javed pointed out. I mean, do we even consider these things? I think that's something very important. Not even a line of recognition in the plan. Forget about implementing it. So I think it is high time. And I'm so glad that we have people like Javed Saab here who's pointing out these things. And, and, and I think all this will be incorporated in our discussions as we as we go ahead. And maybe we'll be able to influence something. 
Jagriti ji is asking why only few states in India have heat action plan. I didn't hear that. Uh, why only few states in India have heat action plan? I think Professor Anil Gupta should answer that. <laughs> he is the head of the National Institute of Disaster Management. So let Professor Anil Gupta answer that and why. But I think it also goes, you know, to the to the to the basic point and you know how do you comprehend these things? I mean, I think still we do not consider heat wave to be such a, a big disaster. So we think, okay, it's just a thing that is happening will pass by as as the earth revolves, rotates, you know, from the sun and move a little bit further and we'll have monsoon and that's how we are going to get adapted. But that's not a scientific way. That's not a scientific way. So we, we should have more. Sir, uh, Subhaji is asking, at the individual level, how can we first adapt to heat waves and mitigate the impact of heat waves? Again, I would say, I mean, it's the same question. Also. Let, let the experts answer that, you know, some of, some of our health people. I'm not an expert on that. But personally, I would say, I mean, I mean there, there are certain things, like A, B, C, D, E, that we should do. Yeah. So another question by Lakshmi Ji. And the question is, uh, what is the role of water resource management towards heat wave scenarios? Absolutely, I think that's a very interesting question. And I believe uh, we, we, we have experts who will be speaking on that. So I just restrict my word, but I think there is a completely integrated approach that is required uh, as far as your uh, water resources. I can just cite you Gorakhpur, for example. You know, you, I mean, Gorakhpur is known to be a town and a city of ponds, but the way these ponds and uh, lakes have been usurped for realistic development, you can easily see feel the difference, you know, rise in temperatures and, uh, you know, the, the kind of heat wave uh, that gets hit in such towns. Gurgaon is another example. I mean, Gurgaon has, uh, uh, I mean, Gurgaon has lots and lots of these ponds. I am, I'm not sure how many, uh, uh, what is the number, because I still remember I quoted that figure somewhere, uh, quoting from a source. Uh, but uh, just see what has happened in Gurgaon now. You cannot survive in for a second without the air conditioner. So, you know, if you have, uh, I mean, water resource management and uh, this heat wave, I think there is a very strong link. Uh, the more we work on that, I think the more uh, baseline data that we, uh, that we collect, I think we'll have uh, uh, more to exhibit. And I, I believe some of our uh, pr uh, presentations would speak differently about that. Uh, sir, Supernaji is asking, uh, right now the countries in Europe are experiencing heat wave and uh, what uh, India can, uh, uh, can, can share some experience uh, from our own learnings of heat waves. Well, what we can share is that, uh, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know whether we learn from them or we share from, from here. I am not sure what does that mean, Dr. Ravi? We learn yeah, from sorry, sir. No, uh, the question is like, uh, if we can share uh, some experience uh, with the European countries, uh, because we also have al already experienced heat waves here. So uh, if we can give them some lessons, <laughs> that's the question. Okay. okay, I think we have to learn our lessons first ourselves, because we have lost people. I don't know how many people have uh, the Europeans lost. But definitely, I mean, if you, if you see that uh, very fabulous work called um, you know, what is that work? Um, Anatomy of a Silent Crisis, okay? That's the UN humanitarian report that says 90% of the impact of climate change, flooding, including heat wave. I'm not sure whether heat wave is a word there, but 98% impact happens in the third world and in the least developed countries. And the loss of lives is almost 95 to 98%, despite the fact that, uh, you know, uh, so I think we have, what we can share, I mean, let's let's try to build some resilient structures. But unfortunately, we've got got. Uh, uh, I mean, we, what we can share is that uh, uh, I think we have to go back to the basics. Um, though we still have to actually, uh, uh, you know, face uh, the realities. I mean, so uh, just cite you only cite me, you know, one example where we have been able to. Uh, exhibit that look this is how uh, how things have to happen uh, though dr uh, gupta said that you know deaths have definitely gone down of course because of uh, because of some proactive interventions so probably the, you know the raising an alarm quite early 
could be one of the one of the uh, lessons that we share uh, with our Western friends. And let let the experts speak about that because I'm not an expert on this. So Jilani ji is asking, how can traditional practices be coupled with technology to mitigate heat wave impact? Absolutely, I agree. Absolutely, I think we, we have examples, but traditional also means, I mean, what is long is the tradition? So I think that uh, we have traditions, as, as I told you, right from the Harappa civilization to uh, you know the uh, the pre-colonial, the Mughal period to the colonial period. But yeah, traditions definitely. Uh, I mean, if 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 we uh, just try to uh, uh, link and club both the traditions and the modern uh, uh, scientific, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, on, on on the basis of science, we can definitely take, for example, housing. I mean, I'm an, I'm really fascinated about that. The shift that we have uh, uh, done from you know our local urban material. To complete RCC, that is reinforced concrete cement, could be one of the important lessons. I mean, how can we go back? And this is what we are experimenting in Ladakh. You know, when you have minus 25 degrees, because there's the inverse. There you have chillblains, okay, instead of a heat in winters. So when it's minus 25, uh, we have been able to exhibit that look just by some simple technology and you know your conventional wisdom. You have constructed a house with a solar passive design where uh, when it's minus 25 outside without heating you have plus 16 degrees okay in in, in ladakh so you have to do the inverse exactly the inverse here so and uh, i think uh, that so that typology has to be something very important where the building typology so um, and then, uh, sorry sir sorry please sir go. go ahead please please go ahead Amanda. Okay, sir. Uh, sir uh, Manishi is asking that uh, the combination of global warming and population growth is connected to rise in heat waves in India and how this problem uh, can be approached from the perspective of policy making and implementation. Well, I do not buy this Malthusian theory that it's population growth because uh, there are reasons for that. I do not think I have time to go into those details. But yes, uh, climate change definitely has an impact. It's not just the population. I mean, that's one of the easiest way to, you know, brush aside the responsibilities that our uh, establishment uh, has. That look, it's the population growth. I mean, so, uh, so, but what I what I feel is, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the impact is there. So, and we have the INDCs, you know, that uh, determined. Uh, our national determined commitments that we made in different COPs, the Conference of Partners of Climate Change, uh, you know, a conference that takes place. How close are we to that? I mean, that's my question. And if we are not, where is that assessment level? Uh, you know, where is that assessment tool that we have made? So I think that is what has to be streamlined and mainstream. Unfortunately, I remember one of the studies done by I don't remember whether it was Iklai or some other organization, you know, the connection between the smart city development projects and its linkage to the climate change was not even 0.1%. Whereas massive flow of capital was going into this project uh, oriented development strategy. So, and then, you know, that report all of a sudden went like completely under the carpet. We do not even know. So the point is, I mean, why I cite smart city? Because these are considered to be lighthouses no, of urban development, of our policy making. So if these lighthouses are like fading uh, in the dark, then what should be the alternative? I think this webinar has a very important historic role, uh, you know, in, in, in bringing out those uh, loopholes, those lacunas. Not that we are contesting what the government is doing. That's not, not our plan. The point is that there is something wrong. Let's point that out. What 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 is what is it that has to be corrected and rectified? So Brema Ji is asking, what is the role of setting up microclimate regions in heat wave region? <laughs> I think it's important, but uh, Arjun, I would say let's keep it to our experts because you know these questions, most of these questions uh, should be dealt by our experts. So uh, let let the experts answer because. Right. Let us take uh, some yeah. questions verbally from Pankaji. Pankaji, if you can unmute yourself, you have been raising hand for a while. Pankaji, Pankaj Bansanji, if you can unmute. 
Okay, please try. Shalendra Gorji, can you unmute and ask your question? Shalendra Ji. Hello, good morning, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Sir, my question is about the technology. Basically, in present time, the kind of lifestyle we are having, that is one of the basis, because I'm a mechanical engineer working for Public Works Government Building and Road, Government of Haryana, and we are dealing with many of such aspects in many projects. Basically, a few, part, a few things uh, Sir has already addressed, and one thing uh, which I think is a little bit ignored by most of us. And uh, that is part of lifestyle we are hanging on. One, every time we are looking for and support, whether that's a purchasing or going out. Second thing, traveling. Most of us will find one person or two person in a car. Third thing, the kind of setup we are making for urbanization. Unscheduled planning, unscheduled pattern, and the self-sustained non-governed policies. Is that uh, one of the factors which we may count that if they got corrected, the thought got corrected, or the individuals start thinking about we should do things in a mannered way. If please be I brief, Shalender Ji, please be in, brief. In, in, the brief question. Sir, in brief, technology can work out only in case if used cumulatively. Individually, one person having a benefit of one thing, other is not having a benefit of that thing. But still, need of that in a urbanization part that is being taken care. Of. How much is our? Uh, how much factors are there which are being considered for such a governing policy? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you want me to answer that? Sir, sir, sir. Yeah, I think sir, it was for you. Okay. The question. I think that's a very interesting question, but uh, how do I look at these things? I look at these things in a very dialectical manner. What does that mean, a dialectical manner? I do not see things in a cause and effect manner. I th see things in an interlinkage manner. So there is an interlinkage between human consciousness, that is the consciousness that you and I possess, and also you know the policy frameworks that actually induce these human consciousness. And both ways, we also induce the policies but the policy framework also induces the human consciousness. Now I'll set one example, okay? You know, I did my uh, fellowship uh, on urban mobility from a city called Leipzig. Leipzig is a city in Germany. And as you are aware, uh, most of you should be aware that now Germany is almost heading for 100% free uh, public transport mobility. Can you believe that? 100% free. I mean, uh, so the very recent report I think I read and Leipzig has been a precursor. Now I'll tell you why it's a precursor, uh, because they are the ones who first experimented that, and you know they occupied the spaces of these large cars, you know your, your uh, motor cars, and handed it over to the cyclists and the pedestrians, and created a commensurate infrastructure to induce people to commute on their bicycles and uh, you know pedestrianize more. Uh, just to cite a figure, because I did fellowship, I still have, uh, remember those figures. 25% of their total commute in the town is on bicycle. Can you imagine that? Probably one of the highest uh, in the world. I'm, I'm not sure. There may be some other cities who have a little higher, higher than Leipzig. So, and then, of course, very high pedestrianization. But that's not the catch. The catch is, you know, how, how we get induced. The catch is that... So, I mean, during one of our exercises, they asked us to go back to the people and explain them. They were further taking away two big lanes, two large lanes of uh, the uh, motor uh, motor cars, and handing it over to uh, you know uh, to the cyclists and the pedestrians. So I asked this professor. I said, you know, already you are highly pedestrianized. 
and uh, why are you doing this? But that's not the paradox. The paradox is how does Leipzig sustain its employment? You know, the largest guzzler, I mean, one of the costliest guzzler produced in the world, Porsche. Porsche has its manufacturing unit in, uh, in Leipzig. So this is a funny thing. I asked this professor, I said, on the one hand, what you're doing is squeezing your space for the motor car. But you sustain your livelihoods, most of your livelihoods, on the manufacturing of Porsche. So for then, for then, for for whom are you manufacturing these Porsche cars? You know, a funny answer that he gave me because he, he and of course a German, he said for you in the third world, in the developing world. So that's why you find. I mean, you come to Himachal, you have all these four lanings. Now you have that four Dham Yatra that's going on. I don't know whether that four Dham Yatra will ever sustain or not. So we are expanding our roads to ensure, you know, these large guzzlers enter. Whereas a policy, so what do we want? Is it mobility of the people or is mobility of the car? That's the question. So once we induce that, and here we have in hi that hierarchical notion also, because if my neighbor has a car, I will also buy a car. But what if I am induced and I'm coerced is that if I buy a car, you know, I'll be penalized. For example, the way it happens in Singapore. You know, where, where you have the certificate of entitlement, which is like equal the cost of your car. There, people will never go buy car. There, you know, this hierarchical status, even amongst the Indians, you know, a large chunk of the population is Indian, would prefer to go to commute by public transport, by metros, you know, by bicycles, and by their bus and the, whatever the tram system they have. So there is a relation. And this relation, what, which side, will actually influence it's only in the process of time uh, and the, the time and space that we can find solutions in all this. For example, now Delhi is really screaming, do you know, with all these flyovers, with all that Barapula and Marapula, how many, how many pullas they are building, still you take one and a half and two hours to reach from one destination to another because you get stuck in a traffic jam. So in Delhi now, this government is really contemplating to have those bicycle lanes and probably some of the designs are coming up very soon because, they, I mean, only then you can sustain, you know, how long can you allow the motor transport to, to the, what you said, technology. So I think there has to be this relationship. Which side would influence? I do not have those answers right now. But the point is, it has to be both ways. The policy inf induces me, it influences me, and the I as an individual also in influences and induce the policy makers. Uh, like I told you, you know, why are we start, uh, still not discussing climate change? I mean, we'll have elections in 2024. Tell me, will or any one of us will be raising these issues of climate change, adaptability? These do not become political issues. Really. So I think it is high time that we just debate it beyond our webinars and, you know, just take it to the policy as well. Yeah. I think I gave a little lengthy reply. Uh, that's all right, sir. But uh, we still have some questions. I think and... I'm done now. Let, 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 let the presentation begin. So actually, we are <laughs> waiting for Himanshu, sir, to join us. Where uh, is he? He must be. I hope he's not covering some event still. Oh, no, he's ready with PPT. I'm trying to connect with him. Sajadji has a question. He has raised hand. Sajadji, okay. would you like to... You can unmute and, and ask your question. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Please go. Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Hi to Tikidaji and all the analysts there and all the organizers. My question is simply this, I had posed as well, how to reimagine and rethink on our actions based on kind of changing human nature interactions. Come again, around I just missed the point, how to reimagine? And rethink our actions, basically our actions, individual actions, and basically simultaneously on the, on the other hand, the collective, on the collective conscience of it. Basically, on the I just uh, want to know more about how how important it is understand and uh, deliberate upon the kind of human environment dichotomy. Basically, on the on the lines of uh, kind of dialectics of nature, uh, Angels had written about it in almost 1887. So, on these things are coming in front. Most of the kind of it has been talked about that all these disasters, human whether they will be human induced or hydrometeorological disasters. Whatever disasters, typology of disasters they are. So basically, there it's kind of both in environment as well as human induced. But what we're seeing is that different uh, kind of uh, spectrums are coming into uh, coming into four. That uh, most of them are kind of uh, in uh, what you have been talking about. I was just listening to, from start your discussion, your talk about it. 
the industrial capitalism and modern capital, whatever we're talking about. So basically, there are other themes of it. Uh, the, the, it's it's very it's very uh, kind of heartwarming to see different uh, uh, kind of connotations have been coming out, whether it be climate coloniality or inequalities in this uh, in human nature inter interactions. So basically, how my basic mood point is that how do we uh, kind of uh, imagine and rethink? and kind of have the alternative uh, perspective of uh, understanding the human nature dichotomy in the dialectics of nature in the in that in their praxi thank you sir well uh, i think uh, if i uh, have to answer that i don't think uh, uh, this webinar is a sufficient space to really go into those details uh, how do we reimagine i think this webinar that we are doing is also kind of reimagining rethinking you know there's some some problem that's why we are reading but i i actually draw the contours far beyond uh, what we are discussing here and i'm not sure sajad whether you are um, uh, uh, aware of a fact but this is something happening this is happening beyond you know the intellectuals beyond just the scope and space of uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, space of the internet and uh, you come to Kinnor, that's a tribal district in Himachal Pradesh. And uh, since I have been there right from my university days, uh, but there they have reimagined and rethought of the process of development. They are not allowing a single hydropower to enter Kinnor. And they have a slogan. If you just search their website, it says no means no. They've taken over. They're not allowing even, and mark my words, soon the movement would grow for you know decommissioning of some of the hydro projects with a massive loss that the tribal kinoras have faced having said that what is the alternative and what is the alternative between development and nature if you ask me i think that's a very relative phenomenon that's a very very relative phenomenon and uh, at, that has to be very specific contextualized you cannot generalize i mean right now you cannot generalize but the bottom line the silver lining is it's the people who must decide. And this is what I'm learning from Ladakh now. And mark my words, I mean, this webinar, many of the participants who are here, I, mean, I can already see there are more than 200 participants. Ladakh is again passing through that transition. You know, when I say go back to the people, because people are the ones who are now, if, if uh, I don't know who, how many of you have visited uh, Leh recently, but if you, if you, if you move from the, uh, from Leh to Karg, all of a sudden you'll find certain patches of land being occupied by the natives. It's a, it's a village common land. But just because they know that the tribal status has not yet been uh, imparted, you know, under Schedule 5 that they're demanding, the land would not belong to them. The land would belong straight away to the government and the government would be the biggest stakeholder. Whereas they are the largest stakeholder. They are the ones who have protected this land. Now, you know, just to that man-nature dialectics we're talking about, so they've already started occupying that land just to ensure that tomorrow, if you know some large investment takes place, then they are one of the important stakeholders. So you know there were something very interesting things happening, uh, some of which are happening in a very quiet manner. But we must keep an eye and we must uh, uh, have our ears to that. And uh, uh, so yeah, so this is something very interesting happening and. Uh, I, I don't know whether this term North Road, many of uh, us will understand, but people from the mountains easily understand that because North Road means breaking new land. And that's how the Raja used to, uh, you know, allow the settlements to take place because you break more land and that's how the, the king would get more revenue. So that law still continues in Himachal. Of course, Himachal was kept in hold and in Kashmir. And there's something very interesting happening uh, in those places. So Sajad, I mean, uh, the bottom line is go back to the people, ask them. Ask them, and I would I would champion a cause. I mean, it's, you know, because I have served a city for five years, the democracy shouldn't be majority over the minority. Democracy has to be ultra democracy if you to sustain it. What do I mean by ultra democracy? I simply mean let there be a veto power with the people. If people say no, no hydropower, we are the biggest stakeholders. Give it back to us. Then I think we should honor that. Else. We have seen these are not sustainable models, and 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 I think uh, maybe I'm sounding too radical on that, but that's a hard reality. I mean, my 30 years of uh, experience in people's movement 
actually teaches me that without engaging with the people, without making them participate, uh, making them part and parcel, and you know, in a participatory mode, you can't sustain. That's it, I think, Dr. Saravi. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, Himanshu uh, Sarji uh, to join us. I think okay. he's trying uh, from his end. Uh, so in the meanwhile, sir, if you have any concluding remarks, uh, we can go ahead with that. If no, not, I think then... I've already stretched beyond my limit. I mean, I was not prepared. <laughs> yes, and sir. this is what Arjun does with me. I mean, you know, I mean, that's uh, his problem. We apologize, sir, like so <laughs> much for this. So, but, yeah, uh... thank you. But uh, please pardon me because I was just to make some introductory remarks. And, you know, because yes, I sir. want to hear our experts. I want yes. to hear our experts. So that uh, what is the new paradigm that we have to actually venture, understand, uh, contemplate, uh, yes. you know, and uh, where we can influence the policy, because that is something very important, how we are able to. Uh, right, so right from the micro to the meta uh, narratives. And uh, Himanshu is excellent. I, I believe he, he joins soon because I've, I've uh, seen yes, him in sir. one of the uh, yeah, presentations earlier also. And so, uh, he is uh, what I call, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, journalists, but we, what I call, uh, you know, one of the Gramsci's term, organic intellectuals. So he's one of the organic uh, journalists that I know in the country. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, definitely, uh, sir. And we are still waiting uh, yes, from his uh, side. Uh, yeah, Dr. Let Arjun. Let us welcome him by his intro. Sorry. Is sure. he there? He is not yet joined. I can't see him in the panel. He will join. Just join. He's responding. You can welcome him till then. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the first uh, distinguished expert for the session of our first day uh, training program is uh, Himanshu Shekhar Mishra. Mr. Mishra is the senior editor, political and current affairs, New Delhi Television Limited, that is NDTV India. And that is the sh uh, short uh, introduction for Mr. Himanshu Shekhar Mishra. And uh, we are still waiting uh, for him to uh, take over the session. Uh, hopefully, he'll be here with us in another two, three minutes. So please bear with us. Dr. Arjun, if you can move the slides and see if it is working well. Sir, is just on. In the meantime, uh, I will just announce uh, the housekeeping announcements once again. Uh, there will be Q&A session after each presentation, and I would request everyone to join the meeting on time for the next two days. And please share your question on the Q&A box. The questions uh, will not be posted and should not be posted as an anonymous attendee. And please ensure that the questions are short and precise and refrain from making any general comments in the questions to save time. Thank you. Has Himanshu joined, Dr. Sarvi? Sar 
yes sir, he is with us but i think he is having some technical uh, difficulties in connecting acha yes sir and who is the next presenter maybe we can ask uh, dr naresh kumar uh, is, is is he there so let's go with dr naresh and maybe he wants you can be clear if if uh, dr uh, himanshu is still yes sir. uh dr arjun uh, should we go ahead with dr naresh kumar sir is trying to join acha let's let's uh, he is with me over the phone okay, okay. in parliament so some issues there let me try one more time just a minute Okay, sir has joined. Imanshu, yeah. sir, can you hear us? Imanshu, sir, your audio, if you can see. Okay, sir has joined. Let us introduce. Uh, sorry, Imanshu, sir, once again. Sure. Uh, so uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Himanshu Shekhar Mishra. He is our first distinguished expert, and uh, Mr. Mishra is the senior editor, political and current affairs at New Delhi Television Limited, that is NDTV India. Uh, good good afternoon, sir, and uh, we welcome you to the program. Uh, please yeah, take over the afternoon. session. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just doing an online introduction. Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes, sir. Yeah, apologies uh, for this delay. I was doing a live broadcast from Parliament. <laughs> There was an opposition protest happening. Oh, uh, I believe uh, Parliament should have a better connection, my man. Yeah, no, I'm in <laughs> media, media center now, than... sir. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm in uh, media center now. <laughs> Just came out. Uh, thank you very much. The subject of my interaction is uh, the rising threat of heat waves in India, and this has been one subject which has been widely debated in last two months. uh just looking at the data that government has tabled in parliament of india uh there is a lot of concern questions being asked in parliament during question hour uh during uh, uh parliamentary standing committee meetings and this is an issue which has been nationally deliberated upon um and this has been also um, a case that has been globally discussed in the sense that we do see those horrifying images of wildfire in europe Uh, in parts of america 
and this of course has brought the issue of global warming uh, to the center stage um, in especially in the context of uh, environment uh, protection uh, my first slide please Uh, of course, I wish to start with uh, the some basic facts about the subject that we're discussing. Uh, this is the Indian Meteorological Department's monthly summary uh, and climate summary for April 2022. This was released on 2nd May 2022. And it says that over the country as a whole during April, the average maximum temperature is third highest with 35.30 degrees Celsius after the years 2010 and 2016. And this is the data that has been analyzed since 1901. And that brings to the fore the larger issue that we are discussing today. The Met Department report also says that the mean temperature is second highest with 29.41 degrees Celsius after the year 2010 since 1901. So even the mean temperature in April was the second highest. Uh, the average minimum temperature is also second highest at 23.51 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this largely shows that uh, across the spectrum, the, the heat waves that we experienced in April uh, made April the third warmest April ever in India's history in last 122 years. Next slide. <clears throat> now, this is the, the data of the temperature that has been recorded, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and the mean temperature uh, in April since 1901. And you can see uh, the, how there is a, a very uneven trend, I would say, in last few years in terms of the, the decrease or increase of uh, maximum temperature. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, the monthly summary report for April of Med Department importantly says, and actually it identifies the problem areas uh, in the country. Uh, it says that over central India during April, the average maximum temperature was highest with 38.04 degrees Celsius in last 122 years. So this is one area uh, where I think the heat waves have been experienced the most. Uh, central in, uh, India. It also says that the average mean temperature in April 22 was highest with 31.35 degrees Celsius for the period 1901 to 2022. And it broke the earlier highest record of 31.10 degrees Celsius in 2010. And this is the worrying trend. And this is exactly uh, the hotspot in terms of uh, the heat wave uh, problem that India faced in April. And even the average minimum temperature was highest uh, during April in central India. And this essentially brings us uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, now I'll be discussing the East and Northeast India, the trends, the heat wave pattern that was visible there. Over East and Northeast India during April, the average minimum temperature was third highest with 21.94 degrees uh, Celsius since 1901. So you can see that whether it is central India or uh, it, is, uh, it is central India or it is east and northeast India, uh, this problem of uh, uh, temperature uh, being a very high has been recorded. Next slide. Now a small quote uh, in, in the global context. Uh, World Meteorological Organization has released a series of reports warming the, warning the global community about the challenge that heat waves is posing, uh, especially in Europe and America. And the, the Secretary General of WMO, Petteri Timlas, uh, has said recently, and this is the July 19th uh, statement uh, that I'm reading now, he says extreme heat in Western Europe is causing devastating wildfires in France and Spain unprecedented drought in Italy and Portugal, and the United Kingdom recorded its highest ever temperature of just over 40 degrees Celsius on July 19th, 2022. And the negative trend, and this is more worrying, the negative trend in climate 
will continue at least until the 2060s, uh, independent of our efforts towards climate mitigation. And that essentially is a kind of a, a warning in terms of the fact that this worrying trend that we are discussing today is expected to continue uh, for at least uh, four decades, uh, in, in spite, uh, independent of our success in our efforts towards climate mitigation. Next slide. Now, this is an image released on 25th July, uh, the latest image released by European Forest Fire Information System uh, Services. And this is the fire danger forecast for 25th July. And as you can see in the screen, uh, the, the, the hot spots uh, which are experiencing the maximum temperature is gradually spreading. I was looking at the earlier data also. Uh, this is a problem uh, that seems to be only intensifying in Europe. Next slide. Now, when this issue has been taken up several times in the last few years in Parliament, uh, in one of the answers that Union Minister uh, Ashwini Chaube had given in Lok Sabha, this is a written reply, uh, when he was asked that why India is experiencing repeated recurring heat waves, he said that the increasing trend in the observed temperatures, as well as increasing trend in occurrence of heat waves, are found to be in line with the global warming trends. The heat wave intensi intensities can be linked to sparser pre-monsoon season rain showers in many areas, as there has been much less moisture than normal of that area, leaving large parts of India arid and dry. This wetter weather pattern coupled with the El Nino effect, which often increases. I think I'm not able to read this slide now often increases temperatures in the country combined to create record high temperatures. And of course, he mentions that the official studies of last 100 years pattern clearly shows that the temperatures uh, continuously seem to be rising. Next slide. Next slide, please. Arjun sir, next slide, please. Well, <clears throat> the heat waves that we are discussing uh, has many dimensions. And this is one study that was tabled uh, in Parliament of India. Uh, this was done by Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. And this study was conducted in 2022. And it talks about how marine heat waves, which is uh, largely uh, seen in the context of periods of extremely high temperature in the ocean, is also increasing. Now, this is a disturbing trend. It's not only uh, the <clears throat> surface area where uh, on the land that we see high temperatures, but even the marine heat waves uh, are also increasing in the Indian Ocean. And it is having an even an impact on the Indian monsoon. And it says that in a study published in journal JGR Oceans, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology researchers have reported a significant increase in marine heat waves aided by rapid warming in the Indian Ocean. And this is uh, uh, clearly a, a subject that needs to be studied more. And they have found that the marine heat waves impact the monsoon uh, rainfall as well. And we have seen that the monsoon rainfall patterns have also changed. And I recently interviewed the Director General of Indian Meteorological Department. And he said on camera, on record, uh, that this year as well, we expect uh, the impact of climate change on monsoon. There could be a change in the pattern in how the rainfalls have normally been recorded in India during the Southwest monsoon season. And he also said that there would be waves when the high intensity rainfall uh, will increase uh, while the low intensity rainfall frequency uh, could decrease. And this pattern is also expected to be visible this year as well. And now uh, we do know that there are research reports which suggest that the Indian monsoon is being affected also by marine heat waves. Next slide. <clears throat> now, these are criteria <clears throat> that we all know 
that med department actually employs to study heat waves and these are well known i mean this has been an issue uh, which have also been discussed in parliament I was looking at the parliamentary debates uh, but this has been the standard criteria for measuring heat waves in india we can share this slide uh, with the participant with the participants arjun sir next slide <clears throat> Now we do know these are set patterns that rise in maximum temperatures as well as heat waves are largely recorded in the months of April, May and June. And there are core heat wave zones, uh, which are the most prone area for heat wave and severe heat wave with highest frequency of occurrence of heat waves during the month of May. And these are problem states, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh. We do know uh, even in Delhi, uh, the, we, I know I report on Med Department there we do really series of reports to suggest that how the heat wave frequencies have increased in Delhi. Next slide. Indian Meteorological Department <clears throat> uh, has also said that in April is the second worst in, in last 12 years uh, in Delhi. This is the frequency of heat waves that have been recorded at the Saftajang Metro Station, Met Station. And I did interview the Indian Met Department Director General on this, and he said that this is, of course, a worrying trend that we have actually recorded. Next slide. Now, what are the impacts? Now, this is also an issue on which members of parliament have asked the maximum number of questions in parliament, uh, that how does heat wave actually impact human health? And there have been lots of data that Ministry of Health Affairs has actually submitted in Parliament. I'll just mention a few of them. Excessive exposure to heat wave leads to dehydration, cramps, heat stroke, etc., and also a sharp rise in the cases of gastroenteritis and food poisoning due to spoilage of food. And of course, the shelf life of food is very, very low due to high temperatures. Alcohol and its fermentation conversion can lead to poisoning. There's also a rise in number of cases of anxiety, palpitations, nervousness, and behavioral change linked to extreme temperature rise. And this is something that we ourselves experience when we suffer from uh, heat wave situations. Next slide. Now, the deaths. Now, this is a very, very sensitive issue. Uh, I was looking at uh, the information that government has made public on this issue, it clearly says that uh, the number of deaths, these are professional figures, uh, there is no centralized data collection that is done, but this is based on the data that has been collected by the Integrated Disease Surveillance Program uh, under the Ministry of Health. And it shows that in, 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 in five years period that they studied, 2015 to 2019, uh, you can see these figures, 2015, 2040 people died, 2016, 1,111, 2017, there was a uh, decline, significant decline in the number of deaths uh, reported from heat waves. And, but at the same time, I was just looking at the data in Maharashtra, for instance, this year, number is very alarmingly high, but that these are numbers not released by the government. These are estimates, but this year the numbers are very, very high, much higher than these figures that we see here. But I'll, we should wait for the government to actually release official data uh, on this sensitive issue. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> heat, what, what has the government done? Now, they have a heat action plan, and during every summer season, this heat action plan is released. <clears throat> And this is a kind of an early warning system uh, that is issued especially to those states which are more vulnerable. And it includes immediate as well as long-term actions that the state governments who are more vulnerable need to undertake to increase the preparedness of the citizens, information sharing, response coordination among government agencies to reduce the health impacts of extreme heat on vulnerable populations. And vulnerable population, of course, includes the majority of poor people uh, who have to work out in the field uh, in the uh, very high uh, temperatures, and they suffer the most uh, from, from heat waves. Next slide. Now, a ground report that I did. I actually shot a ground report on how the heat wave is impacting the wheat crops. Uh, this was uh, shot in sometime in April, and... Uh, uh, if we can play, Arjun sir, this, this story uh, from time 2 to 2.40. 
is possible for you to play uh, click on the web link and i can just show you a small I will 40 try seconds yes. yeah 40 second interview with a farmer he explains how uh, the heat wave has impacted his wheat crop uh, he was from ghaziabad district from modi nagar area इस बार उत्तर प्रदेश की अनाज मंडियों में प्राइवेट ट्रेडर्स हाँ, यस गो टू टू मिनट्स सर इक्कीस सौ पचास से बाईस सौ रूपए प्रति क्विंटल तक की रेट है जैसे गेहूं की पैदावार काफी घटी है या दिस वन पच्चीस क्विंटल तक पैदावार होती थी अब वो घटकर पंद्रह से सोलह क्विंटल के आसपास रह गई है पेट्रोल डीजल की बड़ी कीमतों ने खर्च और बढ़ा दिया है अर्जुन सर वी गो टू दैक्स स्लाइड एंड दिस इज अ ग्राउंड रिपोर्ट माई कलीग हेड शॉर्ट इन पंजाब दिस इज फार मोर डिटेल्ड रिपोर्ट आई i request you to just click on the link the next slide yeah this was shot by my colleague mohammad ghazali who works in punjab and this is how the heat waves have actually affected the farmers in punjab and haryana and how that has impacted the wheat yield and even cases of suicide by farmers were also reported shortage of animal fodder made of wheat straw was also reported and we saw both governments of punjab and haryana take emergency measures to ensure that animals continue to get the fodder that they badly needed uh, during the summer season and in fact the economic impact is very very worrying in fact for the farmers Yeah, there with us, sir. Yeah, you want to uh, play that uh, story, ground report? Yeah, this is the one. There's a link in the uh, in the end. I think this is very important. The context of what we are discussing. Uh, this shows the impact of heat wave on agri agriculture, especially on farmers. Yeah, there is a link, uh, web link. I will try to. in just 10 seconds it will open also hit the wheat crop in punjab and haryana extremely hard it's also led to a spate of farmer suicides gazali gets us this report 
the restaurant family of Makhan Singh, a marginal farmer in Punjab's Mansa district, can't believe he is no more. Wheat growers in Punjab have witnessed a drop in yield and are harvesting only shrivel grains because of this unexpected heat wave. Yield is down by four quintal per hectare in Punjab. 14 farmers have died by suicide in April alone. Meanwhile, in Haryana, the reduced yield of wheat has hit the supply of animal fodder, forcing the administration to ban the sale and transport of animal fodder, which is made of the wheat straw. The wheat straw fodder, which is in high demand for livestock, is being sold between rupees 700 and rupees 1000 per quintal. Even the Gaushalas, which used to get fodder in donation from farmers or at cheaper prices, are facing a shortage. Climate change is real. It's not only impacting farmers, their yield or their income. Many experts say that due to lower yield of wheat, there is a scarcity of animal fodder, which will also impact the prices of milk. So the government will have to formulate a comprehensive policy to tackle this emerging situation. In Fajkula, Mohammed Ghazali for NDTV. Yeah, now we go to the last two slides. Now, we do know that Parliament in many MPs from different parties have also been asking government on what the government has done actually to tackle climate change impact on agriculture, especially. And um, the agriculture minister, in fact, very recently, I think till only last week, uh, submitted a written reply where he said that under the national mission for sustainable agriculture, uh, one of the this is one of the missions uh, within the National Action Plan on Climate Change. Uh, actions uh, have been initiated, policy responses have been formulated uh, to, to actually implement strategies to make Indian agriculture more resilient to the changing climate. And uh, in the next slide, please. Union Agriculture Minister, in fact, uh, on 15th March uh, this year, uh, told Lok Sabha to meet the challenges of sustaining domestic for food production in the face of changing climate, Indian Council of Agricultural Research has launched a flagship network project, National Innovations in Climate Resilient Agriculture. And the project is focused on adaptation and mitigation, demonstration of technologies and farm uh, areas which are far more vulnerable uh, to the impact of heat waves. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, next slide, sir. To address the adverse impact of natural risks on crops, Department of Agriculture ensures comprehensive risks, uh, risk cover for crops of farmers against all non-preventable natural risks. And they've also talked about the new research that has been done, the crops which are uh, more drought resilient. Uh, but we do know in the, in the context of this subject that we are discussing, and with the facts that are before us, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And of course, the SDGs, especially SDG 13, becomes very, very critical, which deals with uh, the, the problem of climate change. India, of course, has taken several steps 
uh, several policy responses have been formulated, but we do know, and April of course should be a test case for us to actually assess what we have done so far, uh, what we need to do in immediate future, and what should be India's long-term strategy to deal with this challenge in the context of the warning that the World Meteorological Department has, has issued that this challenge of heat wave is expected to uh, continue for at least four decades up to the 2060s. Arjun sir, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for this uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, now I would like to call upon um, uh, Tikender ji uh, to share some words uh, about sir's presentation. I don't have to say anything. I think uh, we straight away jump to the questions. I mean, all right, sir. Anshu's presentation has always been excellent. That's why I termed him as an organic uh, journalist. Huh? So, that's so, all right okay <laughs> sir. so then uh, let's, let's go to q &A. yeah okay, and thanks sir. so much thanks so much yourself, yeah. thank you sir can you believe i just two minutes back i was doing a live uh, from parliament on a different subject mm -hmm. and i rushed mm -hmm. to media center and i had to connect to this but it's good that i had prepared my presentation so i could great, share great. some of the basic things with you yeah mm -hmm. thank so you so happy that you were <laughs> please so, uh, so I will read out the question for you, uh, Himan Susha, sir, so you can uh, answer them. Uh, Mr. Fahad is asking, sir, at the policy level, the heat wave is often neglected as a vulnerability. And at the end of the day, it is the individuals that suffer from the excessive heat wave. So what can we do as individuals to sort of mitigate this problem and convince our government to incorporate heat wave in our national climate change policy? Well, I think we need to actually work at several levels. Uh, see, this is becoming a very acute problem for, for the country. Uh, I think government in parliament has laid out a roadmap on what it has done so far to protect agriculture, to protect human life. Uh, there are uh, mitigation strategies that have been formulated, uh, but you know we have to ensure that when, you, when we actually come across these abnormal changes in our weather, uh, the policy responses need to be effectively implemented on the ground. And I think uh, that is one area that needs to be strengthened, uh, that the policy responses and the uh, action, action, heat action plans that have been formulated by the Med Department are actually implemented by the state governments in letter and spirit. But at the same time, I think the individuals also needs to be sensitized in terms of the danger it poses, especially for India's poor labor force. I was looking at um, a, a response from a culture minister where he said that the most number of people who are affected from heat wave are the workers who work at the lowest end. Uh, these are poor workers, laborers who have no option but to go out in the field and work to make a living. And these are people who have been most badly affected from the heat wave. Uh, so clearly we need a strategy to, uh, to give more uh, cover, uh, social security cover to these poor laborers who have to work out in the field in spite, in despite uh, very high temperatures uh, in, in fields, outside, at construction sites. Uh, so we need to do at several levels, but this has to be a very graded uh, response strategy at the level of the government of India, the level of state governments, the level of district uh, uh, administration. And remember the, the NDMA and the SDMA and the DDMA have to play a very, very critical role. There is a structure well laid out. National Disaster Management Authority uh, is the larger governing body. And then the State Disaster Management Authority works in different states. There are district disaster management authorities. We work at the district level. So they have to be far more serious uh, in terms of implementing effective strategies to protect lives. And even animals, I was looking at some data which said that a large number of animals also died. And there was a fodder shortage this time in Punjab and Haryana, which became a very critical issue. So there's a problem of water, there's a problem of fodder also, because remember heat wave not only reduces the yield of important food crops, but they also have a very debilitating impact on the rural economy as a whole. And it disturbs the supply chain uh, it, it disturbs everything uh, in, in the rural economy. So I think we need to have a very concerted strategy at the national level, state level, and the district level, and also sensitize people, start mitigation programs uh, involving people, holding workshops in the universities, colleges, villages, uh, especially where most of these poor laborers live. 
So uh, how would you suggest to control heat wave? And if adaptation is the only way ahead uh, to face these climate changes? Uh, of course, yes. Uh, climate adaptation, of course, should be a focus area. But remember that there is a global warming happening for reasons we all know, and the global community has been deliberating on this for the last several decades. And I remember UN Secretary General again and again has warned the global community that climate change is running much faster than we are. And in fact, recently, just two days back, he said that the Paris Climate Conference, where there was an agreement to limit the uh, increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, that, that itself is not being adhered to strictly. And there are still many governments in different parts of the world who are not seriously implementing uh, or taking steps that they had committed themselves to. So there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done uh, at the global level, at the, in India, at the state level, at the district level. So Ajay Ji is asking which state or region has high uh, heat wave mortalities or cases in India? Well, I think uh, I showed those figures, uh, 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 but there are core uh, heat wave zones in India, and this is largely centered in the central India. Remember the second slide that I showed to you, it very clearly showed that central India actually has reported the highest uh, maximum temperature in last 122 years. Uh, central Indian states have also reported the highest number of uh, mean temperature and uh, minimum temperature and also the mean average temperature. So I think central India is India's hotspot when it comes to dealing with heat waves and all states uh, spread across central India uh, suffer the most. But I think, as I said earlier, I remember a home ministry reply in parliament which categorically said that there is no centralized system of collecting data on heat waves uh, deaths. So I think that is also one area. This is a policy gap that needs to be addressed. India has to first start actually accumulating uh, credible data to actually, you know, it's very difficult also to link uh, a particular death with a heat wave. So I think you need to have a very scientific system of assessing how this is affecting human uh, health and uh, how we need more credible data actually to actually study the impact of uh, uh, heat waves on mortality. Yeah. Dr. Komal is asking, how do we uh, make uh, spread awareness to small scale agriculture and farmers? And how, what are the roles of media in mitigating and spreading awareness on the issue of climate change? Well, I think uh, media has a very, very important role. Uh, remember the outreach capability that media has. I, mean, I remember a, a very senior uh, channel head told me that at a given point of time, a national channel is watched by around 17 million people. So they, they continue to be a very, very effective tool for spreading information, um, even, even to those people who can't read and write. Uh, I remember. Jaipal Reddy, a former union minister, once asked me that why I chose to work in television. So I told him, sir, that I can take my stories to people who can't even read and write. Uh, and when I became a journalist, the, the literacy, illiteracy rate was fairly high in India. So I think, you know, it's these mass media platforms uh, can play a very, very critical role in sensitizing people. And I think government also must use this uh, as a lever, as a as an empowering tool actually to spread across this information uh, to people and give and make them realize that what they actually need to do at the moment, issuing press releases or issuing a national action plan in Delhi or state capitals, I think will not work much on the ground. Surbiji ask, is asking, why are we unable to build our cities with proper climate resilient infrastructure, especially that face more frequent floods like in Mumbai? Well, uh, these are structural problems, and I think Tikendra sir is the best person to educate us on this. Uh, but I do remember I wrote a research paper, which was a comparative study of Srinagar and Chennai floods. Srinagar floods of September 2014 and the Chennai floods of uh, November, December 2015. And there was a lot of similarity in terms of why uh, there was a crisis uh, in both these cities when the uh, flood water entered uh, the, the main city area in both uh, Srinagar and Chennai. And there the storm drainage systems were very badly managed. Then the ability, or uh, then there were illegal constructions in the riverbeds. There are a series of issues. And these are issues we see 
even in Delhi, uh, for instance, or in any uh, big city in India. And these are civic issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, I can I take a break now? I need to rush to Parliament now. Something has happened. Sure, and is sure, continuously sir. Ringing. Sure, sir. We still had some question to go, but maybe some other time. I'll maybe... write. I'll submit it. Uh, sure, writing. sir. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Any for being with us. Sir, any concluding thoughts you want to share? Thirty seconds. Uh, well, I think I, I want to compliment you, uh, Arjun sir, Tikender sir, uh, and all those uh, participants to actually, you know, uh, make this discussion possible. Uh, this is something when I was studying the data and the reports of government of India, I realized that there's not much information available on this still, uh, though the Med Department releases large number of data on, on this subject. But I think in terms of policy responses, uh, there should be MP should have asked more questions. Uh, there should be more debate in Parliament, in state assemblies, uh, the, the National Disaster Management Authority, State Disaster Management Authority, District Disaster Management Authority. They all have to actually work uh, in unison together to actually address this issue. Because this year we have seen uh, that the April has been a very very cruel month, the third warmest ever in 122 years, and the lessons that the heat waves have posed before us, especially in the month of April, are lessons we should not forget. And we have to keep deliberating on this, keep sensitizing government agencies, and we too actually have to work collectively to combat this challenge. Arjun, sir. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for being with us and giving your time to us. Yeah, thank you, bye. Now, uh, moving on to our uh, next session, our next uh, distinguished expert is Dr. Naresh Kumar. Dr. Kumar is a scientist E at National Weather Forecasting Center, India Meteorological Department or IMD. Sir, we welcome you to this program and please take over the uh, session. So over to you. Sir, you are not audible. Unmute yourself. We are not able to hear you, sir. Uh, no. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So again, we lost you. So the voice is not coming. Mm -hmm. So maybe you uh, try joining again. Sometimes it works that way. Right. Right. So Dr. Savik, uh, in the meanwhile, yes. you like to read some of the interesting questions participants have posed. Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in uh, from uh, the starting of uh, this session. And uh, right now we have uh, Sri Tikender Ji. Maybe uh, if he can take some question, sir. No, Dr. Naresh sir. No, the voice is not coming through. So maybe if you can ch check your audio setting. Mm. No, the voice is. Is 
Naris sir is back with us, uh, but uh, he's still trying to connect for the audio. So um, still we cannot hear you. So it's connecting, it's connecting. No, no, sir. We cannot hear you. So maybe you can use the headphones and give it a try. So we cannot hear you still. The hai, kya? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. So finally, we can hear you. So we got your voice Abhi, in between me when you said. Is now it's coming. So now we can hear you. Uh, are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But so I am maybe... not able to listen to you. <laughs> I think. Uh... Okay. Okay, then I will start if you uh, if you are able to listen to me. So I will start my. Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. So please go ahead. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, so I am uh, Dr. Naresh from India Metrological Department and uh, mainly looking after the heat wave over India. So I will discuss about uh, the role of uh, IMD for the heat wave management over India. So uh, generally, uh, how to monitor heat wave over India? So generally, IMD has a big network of uh, surface observatory covering almost entire country. So based upon daily maximum temperatures, climatology of the maximum temperature is prepared for the period of 1981 to 2010 to find the normal temperatures. Thereafter, IMD declared the heat wave based upon the departure from the normal or based upon the actual temperature if it is more than 45 degrees Celsius. So uh, this is a, a we can, uh, this is a slide about the maximum temperatures starting from uh, March, April, and uh, May, June. So if you talk about the March, generally in March, uh, maximum temperatures are mainly observed over the North Peninsula in India, as you can see here in the figures. And uh, as we progress we, in we, April, we the, the slides because we are not able to see. Uh, Northward slide. and comes, that is the North Peninsula in India, and the central part of the country. And in the month of May, we experienced the maximum number of heat wave days and the maximum temperature over the most part of the country. Then it covers North Peninsula India, then central part, Northwest India, and East India also. And again, in June, monsoon starts progressing over the Indian region. So mainly heat waves on uh, comes over the Northern part of the country. So if you talk about that, this, uh, here, this year, uh, here temperatures are slightly different. Here, generally, I mentioned here, if you see the climatology, you can see from the first pictures, maximum temperatures are experienced in North Peninsular India only, or uh, Peninsular India. But this year, we experienced so many heat wave cases over Sorry, Northwest sir. India and Central India. Sir, also. So just a moment, so just Excuse a moment. Space. Just a moment, so uh, this is the definition of uh, India Meteorological Department of Heat Wave. Here we say that we have divided our definitions considering the three different temperatures. One for plains, if it is, it should be minimum more than forty degrees Celsius. For coastal area, it should be more than thirty-seven degrees Celsius. Okay. And 
I, for I don't the understand that. Are, we consider if it is a 30 degrees Celsius or more. This is the first criteria to declare the heat wave conditions. Then thereafter, as I, I have shown in the first slides, we see the departure from the normal. At present, we are considering our normal temperatures from 1981 to 2010 over the different stations of India. So thereafter, we see the departure. If it is a departure is more than 4.5 degrees Celsius, then we will say it's a heat wave. Or if it is a more than 6.4 degrees Celsius, then we will say it's a severe heat wave. Then second criteria, India Meteorological Department consider based upon actual temperatures also. And we declare the heat wave whenever any of the station reported 45 degrees Celsius heat wave or if it is a more than 47 degrees Celsius, then we will say it's a severe heat wave conditions. So sir, there is another thing, sir, warm night is also there and warm night, we consider the minimum temperatures also. So we are the first condition to... is yes. maximum should be more than 40 degrees Celsius. And thereafter we see the departure of the minimum temperature from their normals, same conditions, more than 4.5 to 6.4 degree. Then we will say warm night. And if it is more than 6.4 degrees Celsius, then we will say it's a severe warm night. Sir, we are not this is a general that. temperature pattern of the India. You Sir, can, can you hear us? Generally, starting from January, here the average temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> then it become maximum peak is come somewhere in May, and thereafter it start decreasing. Uh, that is uh, downwards. So peak is in month of May. And similarly, this is the lower one is the temp temperature pattern of uh, minimum temperatures. Here, this is uh, just uh, one of our studies. Here we have considered all the stations. And here we are considering as globally, we consider percentile wise here. So we have considered what is the 98 percentile temperatures, what is the 95 percentiles, and what is the 90 percentiles of the temperatures. Mean 98 percentile mean top 2 percent temperatures of the uh, so we are not able to see the temperatures of the so we are not able to so see here again uh we have just difference of one degree temperatures only if you see the peak 98 degree temperatures hello yes slide i am changing it i don't know what is the problem okay so please share again. Uh, no, is it fine? So please share the screen again. Okay, again I will share the screen. Yes. And sir, so don't go in, in no, full slide visible? mode. Now it's visible, but sir, uh, change here only. Don't go in full slide mode. Yes, sir. So try to okay, change. I go on using PowerPoint. Just I will brief like this one. Okay, thank you. Ah, uh, so this is the uh, annual cycle of the All India Daily Maximum and Minimum Temperatures. Here, what I was briefing. So temperatures in if you talk about the January, it was something around what uh, uh, twenty-five degrees Celsius, and then start increasing, and the maximum temperatures is experienced somewhere in May. And thereafter, again, we will get the decreasing trend. And similarly, we see about the uh, our uh, minimum temperatures also. So this is another cycles of the India mean climatological temperatures of the threshold for 90, 95 percentile and 98 percentile of the maximum temperatures. Here also, we experience, again, a peak is somewhere in May. And the peak temperature may top 98 percentile is more than 41 degrees Celsius and 95 is somewhere around about 40 degree and 90 percentile is somewhere around about 39 degrees Celsius. So here uh, we have, uh, this is a mean maximum temperatures between 1967 and 13 for the March to June. And here, if you see the first slide, here mean maximum temperature we experience maximum temperatures over West Rajasthan, followed by North Peninsular India, Vidarbha adjoining Telangana, and there is a third 
peak is somewhere over south up and north madhya pradesh and if you see the highest maximum temperature days also that is over the same regions so this is the average heat wave of days between march to july so this is i have taken from some paper and here again we experience is maximum heat wave days is over you are uh, same thing over whatever i have shown in previous slide rajasthan then up then our north peninsular india main vidarbha telangana and coastal andhra pradesh and then thereafter followed by over odisha madhya sorry odisha then uh, bihar and uh, jharkhand and this is the second one this is a severe heat wave severe heat wave we mainly experience is over uh, some part of uh, that is west rajasthan punjab or that is east india main that is over bihar and adjoining areas so uh, this is the average uh, heat wave days so if you see the average almost in march there is hardly any heat wave we get one or two days over gujarat then south mp and somewhere over uh, that is uh, odisha and as we move forward in april it further increases towards the north india and may there are the maximum number of heat wave days over the central northwest and east india that you can see from the third figures and june also it is a mainly over the northern part of the country and if you see the average heat wave days over july sometime we experience is over rajasthan haryana and punjab only so uh, in general if you talk the duration of heat wave is 5 to 6 days but sometime it can go up to 10 days also and severe heat wave uh, don't goes much generally 2 3 days only and maximum heat wave frequency as i have mentioned it is over month of may over the number of heat wave days over bihar rajasthan up is more during the month of june as compared to the other month generally as casualty of the heat wave Occurs whenever the temperature is more than 40 degree. So, as per the India meteorological criteria, also to declare the heat wave, we consider 40 degree Celsius temperatures or more. So, uh, this is a generally uh, just uh, slightly scientific slide. What are the favorable conditions? So, if you see the all the conditions, generally we experience is winds are. just to see the first figures wind is are coming from a uh, pakistans and there is some sort of troughing mean troughing mean low pressure zone over i uh, suppose east india if this is there wind is coming from the pakistans then we will experience severe heat wave over this regions so this is the favorable conditions almost in the all the cases there is a troughing winds are coming from pakistan mean generally winds are westerlies and over pakistan generally the temperatures this is 49 even 50 degree celsius and winds come from that regions and as a result our temperature over the other parts of india rises due to under its influence so uh, just i will uh, uh, discuss about uh, this year scenario so this is a heat wave scenario over uh, 2022 here uh, first slide is march another is april here you can see the figures also generally as i have shown the climatology hardly we see very heat wave conditions over north part of country but we have experienced 13 heat wave days over rajasthan even west mp also and even this time himalayas has also experienced a lot of heat wave days and even gujarat 11 and other region also received the heat wave conditions so mainly heat wave can find over the gujarat and Uh, you are uh, Rajasthan area and Madhya Pradesh area. In April, heat wave conditions if you consider almost most of the days there was a heat wave or severe heat wave conditions over Rajasthan, even Haryana, West UP, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand also. So this was highly abnormal in this year. So uh, just uh, uh, this is a slight. Uh, if you see the heat wave trend in March. the normal temperatures was that was maximum normal temperatures were 33 degree and which, which was the highest among all the data from 1901 to 2022 and uh, in april also there was three peaks but april was uh, this was the 
when there was a three highest one is in 2010 followed by i think uh, 17 and there was 2022 it was 35.30 so uh, just uh, uh, generally what happening if you see this march april this season we received so much heat wave conditions but if you talk about uh, your uh, year 2021 we have not received any heat wave conditions the major reason behind it is in general we see the rainfall whenever there is a rainfall thunderstorm activity naturally there is a no heat wave conditions so this is our rainfall over uh, march and april you can see the third figures in uh, upper panel and lower panel what if you see the there was high negative anomaly in himalayas rainfall was very less in plains, we have not received any rainfall. So this was the one of the major cause of heat wave in both of us. So just I will go slightly scientific. So what is the cause behind it? So if you see this figure, whatever I have shown in this one, this is a surface air temperatures here I have considered. And if you see uh, upper one, 75 degree north to 90 degree north. Here, what you found here, this is the surface temperatures departure from the normals. I mean here, this is, I have taken NSAP uh, reanalysis data. Here they have considered the normal from 1991 to 2020. You can see here, North Pole temperatures are five to nine degree above normal. So one can ask, what was the reason if the North Pole temperatures are too high, what is the relation of North Pole temperature with the Indian heat wave condition? Generally, uh, again, uh, I go slightly scientific. Generally, everything is related with the Western disturbances. In March, we received so much rainfall over Himalayas, adjoining plains also sometimes due to the Western disturbances. And your Western disturbances is controlled by, if somebody has heard about, subtropical westerly jet streams. And your jet stream is controlled by temperatures. Generally, in winter, jet stream shifted north southward, mean towards over the Indian regions. As a result, jet stream shifted southward, it caused uh, more WDs and it caused the under its influence. If I go, if somebody can understand, if jet stream is the south of its normal position, comes southward, it creates more divergence, mean divergence mean high pressure zone at high level. As a result, there will be a unstability at lower level. I mean, scientifically will say it create more convergence. It's mean there will be a more unstability, mean WD will be the strong and as a result, we get the rainfall over this regions. So this I have explained in this one. So during March month, there was a six fever western disturbances. WD was there, but it was fever. And why it was fuel? This was the main reason is the North Pole, as because mainly the jet stream was not shifted towards the south. As a result, the rainfall was very much deficient. Hence, there was no moisture in the upper atmosphere, and it was practically colorless, color, and which allow maximum insulation over the region, over northwest and joining area, which was which is the favorable for the heat wave over the region. In addition, there was a large amplitude anticyclonic flow, I mean high pressure zone over the center Pakistan and adjoining area. And the temperatures was in March itself was 40 to 43 to 45 degrees Celsius over central and South Pakistan region, mainly second because of March. And generally in March, winds are the westerlies as a result, which was the favorable for the rising temperatures over Northwest and Central India. This is just some scientific part. So uh, now, uh, now I come to our what was the title of my presentation? What India Meteorological Department is doing for the heat wave? Generally, from March to June, we issue the special bulletins of the heat wave related to first March to thirty June. So here we issue in morning bulletins. And thereafter, impact based color code bulletin we have issued at 4 p.m. every day, including the impact of minimum temperature, humidity, and winds. 
these all parameters play very very important roles as if you talk about the coastal area there is a generally high rate of the death rate but temperatures are not so high as compared to the northwest india in rajasthan we experience temperature up to 50 degree but there is a hardly any death but if you talk about your coastal area telangana uh, sorry coastal andhra pradesh odisha here the death rate is high the reason being humidity if temperature is high humidity is high anyway you people are also have experiences in monsoon season if you talk about the last monsoon season in june there was a lot of uncomfortable in delhi also the reason was temperature was not so much high but humidity was very high similarly in coastal area this was the case but the temperature is somewhere even in 40 degrees celsius if the humidity is high then there will there may be the casualty and there will be a more health uh, it will a uh, highly affect the human health also so so from uh, this year even i think last year also we have included impact of minimum temperature humidity wind while, while giving our color code warnings thereafter these warnings in addition to that one we are issuing four daily bulletins by national weather forecasting center our regional center issue the district wise rainfall forecast sorry district wise heat wave warnings so here all the warnings we issue the different user through email cap or saw facebook twitter press release to the different uh, like user mha ndma sdma cs of states dcdm of different states health department indian railway and road transports and thereafter we also issue the outlook for the 15 days and then seasonal outlook for the one month that we also issue during this periods so this is just a in additions we issue the daily press release and daily video also so this is just a format of daily press release what we have issued we mention over the temperatures maximum temperatures and thereafter there we include everything even rainfall also so that press release we issue every day and thereafter a video for what will be the two days observed weather and outlook for the next five days so this is a again format of press release and then we add the what will be the expected impact and the suggested actions for the heat wave so this is a another daily bulletins that what we have issued at 4 pm here we write the maximum temperature scenario what will be the heat wave just today what is the maximum temperatures that we consider at 9 utc 9 utc mean 9 plus 5 that is uh, 230 uh, sorry yeah 230 pm temperatures and there after departure minimum temperature departure humidity and finally we give it as a heat wave for in color code warning as you can see from the figure next five days what will happen and likely some time so this is a we issue our heat wave impact in the three color codes one is green green one there is a no warning yellow mean then the first is yellow then orange then this is a red one so color code we consider as depending upon the heat wave days if it is for two days then yellow if severe heat wave condition prevail likely to persist for two days and uh, with very very its severity and likely to persist for four days mean heat wave or severe heat wave part four days then we will give orange and if it is a severe heat wave prevailing for more than two three days then we will go for red color so what will be the some facts and suggested actions as per the ndma guidelines that is ndma guidelines only and thereafter we issue the extended week, weekly bulletins what will be the weekly scenario of the heat wave generally we will write what will be the temperature for next one week and second week then the probability of in general what will be the heat wave just like if you see the last one that may not be visible for you heat wave to severe condition in many parts likely to continue over west rajasthan and and some parts of uh, just like uh, we have mentioned it here uh over west rajasthan in some other parts of uh, east rajasthan madhya pradesh and isolated pockets that one week heat wave forecast then in week 2 we write general heat wave warning like heat wave at isolated pocket likely over plains of northwest india and over eastern rajasthan central india during some days of the week so this is a seasonal or tool we give about that maximum temperature and minimum temperatures and uh, thereafter uh, from last two year we keep everything in gis platform 
So we create the inductive map for the actual maximum temperature, the departure from the normal, then inductive map for heat wave, severe heat wave, warm night, very warm night, and then inductive map for five days, actual temperatures, it departs from the normal and it's burning for next five days. Similarly, we keep the past five days also, then we kept the also humidity and other, another parameter, we kept it here. That is the temperature threshold 90, 95 and 98% percentile also. So this is a dedicated phase. We have created heat wave guidance during March to June that you can see from our websites. Here we have given everything like daily impact based heat wave warning bulletin, standard outlook, seasonal outlook, then interactive map, whatever for the actual temperature and heat wave, then all the humidity map as humidity has high effect of the heat wave as already I have mentioned it here. Then we have station threshold for the maximum temperatures based on the percentile methods. If anybody want to prepare heat action plants, this is for those people, they can see what is the 90, 95, or 98 percentile of their stations. Then we have kept the FAQ on heat wave and heat wave warning skills of the IMD. Then whatever the NDMA guidelines for the heat wave that we kept in our websites also. So this is the climatology we have prepared for the threshold of the, all the stations of the India for the 90, 95, 98 percentiles for the different months and mean humidity. And this is the heat wave related GIS pills. So in addition, based on this one, these temperatures, we also give the uh, temperature departure based on the percentile also that you can see from the lower pictures, ABC, we have mentioned it here that we also have included National highway we have included. Somebody want to see the temperatures of the national highway. So approximate uh, uh, that we have included. Indian railway network has been included. So in another initiative, India Meteorological Department, we have done heat hazard analysis of the entire country. Here we have considered heat wave, severe heat wave conditions, and how many number of days it persisted. Then consider the relative humidity, wind speeds, and whatever I have mentioned, duration of heat wave par and uh, number of days heat wave persisted over some reason. Based on that one, we have prepared uh, all the maps and uh, this is an experimental base. Shortly, we will put it in our website. Yeah, thank you. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Sir, am I audible to you? Uh, for taking up the questions, uh, I'm just connecting with uh, Dr. Naresh. I think your voice is not coming to me. <laughs> I think. Uh, is it just Dr. Dr. Surubi's voice, or are you able to listen to me, well, Dr. Naresh? Are you able to hear me? I don't think anybody can hear, hear okay, you. Great. There's some so, yeah, audio, yes. some audio uh, issue there. Better you call them directly. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. You can call me. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead, Dr. Sarovi. Yes, sir. I'll just call him. Uh, G. The number you have dialed is fifty. <laughs> I'm just dialing his number. Well, if he looks at it, the QA is Q and A is himself. Can you just ask Dr. Naresh to look at the Q and A's and probably answer straight away? That will be a better option. So we try calling again. Yeah, call him. Call him and just tell him. But please look at the Q and A's. Hello. Uh, Hello. Ha, ji, ha, ji. You can ask yes. me the question. Yes. yes. Thank you, Sumi, so much. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I will read out the questions uh, to you so you can answer them and everybody can hear you. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, one question is by Dr. Satya Naranya ji. The question is, is there any relationship between heat waves and ENSO? Yeah, there is a relationship. Uh, generally, uh, I don't uh, remember what the heat wave. General heat wave, cold wave. Sometimes, if it, there is an so, uh, I think the number of cold wave days are more. But I don't remember. But there is a relation between heat wave and in so is there. Okay, sir. But Thanks, I don't sir. remember so far. Yeah. So another question is, uh, why, why, why is the number of deaths more in coastal regions? Sorry, will you repeat it? Why, why the number of death, deaths are happening more in the coastal regions? Number of days in the coastal? Deaths, deaths. Uh, will you repeat, please? So why is the number of deaths more happening in the coastal regions? Yeah, basically this is due to the impact of the humidity. Okay. Yeah, humidity is high in the coastal regions. So I think everybody is familiar with that one. If the humidity is high and temperature is high, it has a more impact on the health. So that may be the reason there is a more health, uh, sorry, more death in the coastal regions. Okay. Uh, so another question is by Anuprita ji. And the question is, what is temperature departure? Temperature departure in first slides uh, I have shown, uh, we take the normal temperatures between uh, 1981 to 2010. 30 year periods and thereafter what is today's temperatures and we will see the what is the normal temperatures between 1981 to 2010 and today's temperature difference is called the departures from the normal. If today's okay. temperature is higher then we will say positive departure. If today's temperature is less as compared to the normal temperatures we will say there is a negative departures. Uh, Simi Mehta ji is asking, uh, sir, can you tell the difference between measured temperature and feels like temperature? What is the difference? The year uh, Delhi temperature felt like 52 degrees. That's the example. So what is the difference between measured temperature and feels like temperature? I cannot give the answer. Okay, sir. Just we measure the temperatures as per the IMD criteria. We see the what is the station threshold. I cannot say. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, so another question is uh, by understanding topography, can we strengthen climatology? Sorry, by understanding topography, mm -hmm. can we strengthen climatology? Is there a link between the two? Uh, basically. Topography, I, I don't think there is any relations. The lamplogy depends upon the station's values for the long period. Just like I am telling, we are considering 1981 to 2010. We consider all the station prepared, prepared. Accordingly, we will prepare the, what is the, its normal values. Similarly, if it, there is a topography, Himalayas is there, then naturally their temperature will fall as we, we move upwards. So, and then the maximum temperature will be less. Hello, sir. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, uh, another question is uh, why heat wave is high in West and Central India compared to rest of India? No, no, no. Heat wave I have shown it's higher over Rajasthan and Vidarbha reasons. The major reason is uh, that I have explained in my slides considering the case of March, April 2022. The maximum temperatures is there due to the uh, anti-cyclones over the Pakistan area and wind comes from the that reason as a result we experience high temperature over this reasons. The maximum temperature we experience over central part of Pakistan and generally their temperatures are due to deserts also are there, there are so many factors, whatever I have mentioned in my slides also, that is a favorable factor for the heat waves. And due to that one, the winds comes, the winds are generally westerlies, it comes from Pakistan to our India region as a result of Texas rose more over this region. 
So another question is by Kirtanji. And the question is, what is the ma major reason for heat waves? Is it the pollution or is it due to the sun? I think uh, uh, that person has not uh, listened to my presentation. I have given the answer already. I have given 2022 case of March and April. What was the reason? Uh, everything it is there in my, my presentations. This is due to the wind, factor, wind pattern only and clear skies. There is a more insulation. These are the reasons mainly. Okay, sir. Another question is by Sailendra Ji. Uh, the question is, uh, India is getting worse technology, uh, for example, CFL lights, CNG engines, etc., which causes a lot of uh, heat producing uh, instances. So in order to curb this, uh, will government of India uh, do something all, about I it? Cannot, I cannot give the answer. I am the forecasters. I just, okay. uh, this is not a letter to my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Then another question is by Jaydeep Ji. Are heat waves more due to meteorological reasons than climate change? Yeah, this is the mainly due to the meteorological reason more. Yeah. For example, I explained if you talk about 2021, we have not experienced any heat waves due to the mainly thunderstorm activity over the most part of the country. Almost uh, last year, Hardly we have experienced very few days of the heat wave, specifically in June and then first week of July only. But this week, this year we have experiences from March that is highly abnormal. Anyway, global temperatures are rising, everybody knows. But there are the meteorological conditions which cause the heat wave more. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Anu Arunji is asking, what is the average annual increased temperature of Earth? Mm, I think. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but that I don't remember exactly. Okay, sir. Maybe 0.5 Celsius for long period average they have calculated, but well, exactly very strong post, place to place. Post uh, industrial uh, period, we've already reached 1.1 degrees. The average okay. temperature, yeah. That's the data that we have. Yeah, anyway, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um... Uh, Gowar G is asking, the states with no heat waves needs to have a heat wave action plans in place? Yeah. So this is the initiative of NDMA. They want the heat wave action plan should be extended to the city of the India. Accordingly, we have kept all the percentile value, whatever the city is required, kept in our websites and they can take from India Meteorological Department. We kept it generally heat action plan is prepared based upon the percentile method. So we have kept 90, 95, 98 percentiles. So that we have kept, ideally it should be with every city to consider it, yeah. Yuvraj is asking, does the climate of a particular place change after around 30 years? Uh, no, basically what was the criteria globally to see the climate pattern? Ideally we should have 50 year data so that uh, sometimes just like uh, if you talk about the this year heat waves last year heat wave i am briefing again and again last year there was no heat wave this year there were so many number of heat wave days are more so based upon this uh, small data we cannot say there is a climate change so for climate as per the wmo minimum we have to consider the 30 year periods ideally it should be 50 minimum should be 30 okay so uh, Dr. Komal is asking how, how the use of ACs affect increase in heat waves. That I cannot give the answer. Naturally, there is an urban island effect. In the urban areas, we experience more heat waves. In where is the vegetation is more, we are experiencing the less heat wave. So this is the reason ACs also come under the urban heat, heat island effect also. Okay. Uh, it is a meeting heat. Yeah. So uh, Manish Ji is asking, how can weather forecasting contribute in mitigating heat island effects? I cannot give the answer. There is a no much relations. We give the weather forecast. The, our motive is it should be reached to everyone so that they can take the precautions accordingly, whatever the warning we are issuing for the heat wave suggested actions or NDMA guideline for this one. That was the answer. 
Uh, so Madhurima ji is asking, what are the ways we can reduce the gap between resilience as a concept and resilience as action in rural or urban scenarios? I cannot give the answer. Uh, I request you kindly ask the letter to forecasting only. Sure, sir. In the meteorological department. India yeah. meteorological department providing the forecast. I can tell about the climate change. Uh, generally, I am the weather forecasters. I am providing the forecasting. So you can ask it later to that. Uh, that okay, also. okay, sir. Definitely, I got it. Uh -huh. uh, so there's one more uh, relevant question to you. That mm -hmm. is by Sabiha ji. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, the heat waves are alarmingly increasing in colder regions. And that is very worrying. If I talk about Kashmir, some days we experience most hot days and other days we experience low temperature. How concerning is this? That is very true. Generally, we also experienced, I am not saying we respond the data, but if you see the studies also, the temperatures over the Himalayan region is slightly increasing at a slightly faster rate. That is very good. Yeah. Uh, generally, uh, earlier, uh, hardly we consider heat wave warnings for the Western Himalayan. Uh, nowadays, we are uh, very much concerned about the Himalayas also. So there are so many heat wave episodes is also there generally in dark world. Almost all the hilly stations, specifically this year, March, it was highly abnormal. As I have shown the figures also, there were so much heat wave days over the Himalayas, which was early hardly there was two or three. This time there are too much high days over the Himalayas. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. This one more uh, question, uh, Mr. Kartike has raised his hand. Uh, if you have any relevant question for sir, then I request you to go ahead, unmute yourself and ask the question. Kartike ji. Hello. Okay, I'll move on to the uh, next uh, Participant Jaydeep Ji, please go ahead and ask the question. Okay, we can go to next. Supervat Ji, uh, Dr. G. Satyanara. Yes, Supervat Ji. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Actually, uh, uh, is the uh, most uh, fundamental things to minimize the economic of the uh, uh, rural uh, farmers during that period. Uh, actually, uh, uh, our uh, IMD announcing the uh, pre uh, assessments of the heat wave, uh, but it is not reaching actually to the ground. Uh, what are the uh, methodologies we have to adapt so that the uh, heat wave uh, uh, the IMD messages should reach to the ground. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, did you hear the question? No, no. Please, will you repeat it? Okay, okay. I'm really sorry. Uh, I apologize, participants. Uh, you need to uh, type the question because sir is not able to hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do. yeah. So, um, uh, sir, if there is any uh, Concluding remarks from your side, uh, Dr. Naresh, uh, uh, please conclude the session. Thank you. So basically, uh, Ben, whatever you have told, we should uh, have heat action plans for the city of India, so that whatever the warning India Meteorological Department is issuing, it should reach to the general public and uh, as per the, along with the disaster managers, heat action plan should be prepared for the ECT of India so that uh, we can better monitor the heat wave and uh, help the peoples. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, there is a technical error here and uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Naresh uh, for his presentation and uh, taking up all the pertinent questions uh, from the participant side. Uh, so this was uh, the last session uh, for our training course of day one. Uh, now, now I would like to invite uh, Tikender Singh uh, ji uh, to share some words and uh, end the session. So over to you. 
Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Sorry for taking all those pains. I mean, right from the inception, you've been there and uh, handling this session. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, I think, uh, as I say, well begun is half done. So uh, probably uh, these two presentations were quite interesting. And also, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Naresh because he was very, uh, you know, uh, plain in saying that some of the issues that he cannot deal with uh, are to be dealt in uh, other sessions. I mean, I, mean, I really uh, consider that to be uh, very prudent. And uh, but I think something which is uh, which has come out very uh, 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 very starkly is that um, uh, I, there's a big role that the meteorological department has to play, particularly with respect to the early warning systems. We've seen how these early warning systems have helped us in our coastal regions uh, in respect of cyclone warnings and where uh, a big number of lives, you know, when we used to lose, uh, we were able to uh, protect them. Uh, I think for the heat waves also, now how do we create this mechanism? Probably uh, we have to pitch in there Air IDM and the city governments, and just to bring in this interface so that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, all these alerts are part and parcel of, uh, like, you know, the, your daily uh, uh, radio transmission kind of stuff on the on the mobile phone. Uh, some cities have already experimented that. Probably this could be one of the smart city missions, important elements or roles to play, uh, where, you know, you have these early warning systems, particularly in those areas which are extremely vulnerable. Uh, and as uh, we have already identified, I mean, this was a misnomer that, you know, Rajasthan is going. Rajasthan, I mean, definitely they have uh, 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 rising temperature. I mean, the temperature is far higher than other parts of the country. But the deaths uh, happen in other regions, particularly where you have a, a more humid environment. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, that that's interesting. And uh, so was uh, uh, Himanshuji's presentation, I mean, he, where he brought in, you know, uh, all that metadata, particularly from the policy making perspective, since he covers the parliament. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's been um, a good day. And uh, I'm quite uh, astonished, Arjun, by the way, the number of questions that are really uh, popping up, because uh, this is something that we did not experience in our previous uh, uh, interactions or in our previous, uh, you know, workshops or training programs. So this is really good. I mean, I'm really happy that, uh, you know, uh, there's more interaction taking place. Uh, probably we'll make it more vibrant and uh, more participatory. So we'll try to create those uh, interfaces uh, more often. Uh, maybe, uh, I, and I, I think we are doing that because we are not waiting for the, you know, for the, uh, all the presentation to finish. And once uh, the presentation is over, then we take that up. So, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, been um, a lovely day and, uh, I don't know what's happening in Delhi, but in Simla, it's raining. And uh, so just uh, enjoy the day left. And uh, thank you, Sarveed. Thank you, Impri team. And of course, uh, Dr. Gupta ji and IDM and all for uh, uh, for this interesting session, uh, first day session. And uh, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow again, same time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for sharing your words with us. Now, as we come to end of day one of a three-day immersive online certificate training program on understanding recurring heat waves, risk, impact, and the way forward for resilience. This training course is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, and IMPRIS, Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, or CECCSD, Impact and Policy Research Institute. I, Saurabhi Himire, researcher at IMPRI, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, and National Institute for Disaster Management, or NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, India. We are grateful to our experts for the day one of this training, Sri Himanshu Shekhar Mishra and Dr. Naresh Kumar. We thank the patron for the program, Sri Taj Hassan, convener and moderator, Sri Tikender Singh Panwar, our conveners, Professor Dr. Anil K. Gupta, Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. Somya Deep Chattopadhyay. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively involved in today's deliberation. We welcome you tomorrow. 
July 26th for our day two session of this excellent training course by distinguished experts, Dr. Gulrez Shah Azhar, Professor Joyshi Roy, Anup Kumar Srivastava. We hope you continue to join in future to our IMPRI web policy talk and web policy learning. Wishing you a very good evening and thank you. <laughs>